I don't have an accent. <laughs> you guys talk funny. My name is Peter, recovered alcoholic. Uh, grateful to be alive and sober and part of a sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, some folks uh, have been talking to me and saying, this is really big of you to come out here and speak for us and do a workshop on top of it with Rick. And uh, I said, oh, it's really no big deal. And then I looked at the weather report at home, it's 84 and sunny, and I realized this really is a big deal on my part to be here. <laughs> Um, glad to be here. I've been to uh, this uh, state a whole bunch of times, so it's good to see Morris and a whole bunch of other folks here and get to share the podium with Rick. Uh, Love and God separated me from alcohol on June 23rd, 1988. And um, because of that power and the 12 steps in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, I can talk to you currently about what it's, being, what it's like being a recovered alcoholic, because that's how I announce myself as a recovered alcoholic. And I do that uh, because anything less than that would be falsely humble. I don't do that to be unique or sound cured or different from everyone else. I'm a spoke in a very big wheel that God has created. But it's really important to speak truth when we get an opportunity to share. And you've invited me here. I have a life of invitation to share my experience, strength, and hope. And part of that is about living in a world of the spirit. Experientially talking to you about that power which separated me from alcohol on the day of June 23rd, 1988, where it's brought me to this afternoon, this morning, to share with you. And as a recovered drunk, I know what it's like to be a recovering alcoholic in something I never want to visit again. I never want to be a recovering anything anymore because I know what that feels like. I know what that looks like. I know what that tastes like. And the way I've been brought up in Alcoholics Anonymous, being recovering just simply means I'm untreated. And where's the great hope in a message like that for someone sitting here saying, that's it, just recovering, hanging in there a day at a time, when our book shouts in the rooftops about what God can do for us, with how God can take us to a place of entering the world of the spirit where the mind is no longer the master, but just the servant. And so I get to serve God, I get to do Alcoholics Anonymous, I get to work with others, I get to do a lot of get-tos in Alcoholics Anonymous. It wasn't that way when I showed up and Rick shared beautifully about the struggles of coming in here beaten down by booze, thinking just removing of the symptoms is all I need to do. Uh, thus we have don't drink and go to meetings, which is not really a truth. Because if I had the power as a real alcoholic, the guy on page 21 just to not drink, why would I have to come to an AA meeting for it? Stay home. I'd be at the beach today, hanging out, getting drunk, and you pull me out of, you know, some place later on tonight. But as a drunk with no power, choice, control, um, I can't stay away from the next drink, no matter how many meetings I go to or don't go to, no matter how many things I put before this or de to deter me from drinking, I go drink. And when I drink, I tend to do some other things, like eat a lot of pills. And then you come bail me out or you come to the emergency room and it just goes on and on and on. And every time I reemerge remorseful with the, uh, uh, a firm resolution, I'm not going to do it again, I'm doing it again. Even though I don't want to drink, even though I don't want to take other non-conference approved dry goods, I'm in. And I do a lot of damage and I infect other people. And Rick talked great about that. But what happens to us when we're around here a little while? including some of us who claim to have gone through the 12 steps from the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. And a lot of those folks call me up because they've hit a wall. I said, what's going on? And when I talk to them, the first thing I ask them, do you have a sponsor? And they usually go, well, that means no, there's no sponsor. <laughs> and do you have a home group? Well, an alcoholic can never just answer yes or no. There's a four-hour story behind every question, right? <laughs> so we don't have a home group. We don't have a sponsor. What's your 11 step look like? And they say, what do you mean? Now they know they're in trouble. And what happens to a lot of us is the way we go forwards through the steps, we take a look at the surrender. We ex surrender before we even get into Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a surrender, a spiritual, emotional, physical surrender for me before I got into Alcoholics Anonymous, which really was the catalyst for me to embrace this work, the catalyst to have this spiritual transformation that came in the worst moment of my life, the day of June 23rd, 1988. Come into Alcoholics Anonymous and get a sponsor with the big book, and we begin the journey through the book. And I really get to take a look at my powerlessness, my unmanageability. What is unmanageability really talking about here? And the solution, the pointer in two, and I make a decision, and off I go, and four through nine, and for a while, as Bill says, the goose hangs high. 
Things are going okay. I'm feeling good about me. I'm feeling good about you. I'm starting to make amends and things are going nice. And Dr. Harry Thibault talked about the reemergence of ego, the reconstruction of ego. I feel so good. I fall in love with me. I read my own headlines that everyone's saying I'm so great. I start to believe I'm Moses in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that Jesus actually confers with me once in a while about what to do for AA. And I think I have some sort of great part in the little sponsees that I have on look what I've done for them. And my home group can't survive without me. And the ego starts to run the show, ease God out, and we little by slowly we start going backwards through the steps and it looks like this. Nightly review is a thing of the past. There's no such thing. Guys, I will tell you, I speak to so many folks who are doing big book workshops, who are sponsoring people who haven't written nightly review in years. Don't even have a 10 step in their life. Meditation, that's gone. One of the first practices to go by the board is meditation. And as far as prayer, when folks, my sponsees would tell me this. Did you pray this morning? I prayed on my way to work. Where? In the car. You didn't pray. <laughs> and so 11 step is out the window. There really is no 10 step going on. I'm doing a quick spot check, which usually means if I, they didn't do this, I wouldn't have done that. Instead of taking my own inventory, my amends list is still my amends list. It hasn't gotten cleaned up. I haven't cleaned up any outstanding amends that I'm consciously aware of. Defects of characters, talking to the gentleman in the back, defects of characters still flourishing, which drive me back to calming more people, which keeps me away from uh, seeking this power called God, which keeps me away from meditation because defects insist that I'm right and you're wrong. They okay my nonsense. And defects are running the show. I don't have a sponsor. I'm not consulting with anyone. As far as turning it over, I'm turning it over to me because I've become God. How can I meet God if I'm playing God? And if I'm not serving God, my experience has been that means you need to serve me. And if you're serving me, I know in my heart of hearts I'm a weak and feeble God. Insane thoughts start to come back. I start to behave inappropriately. I don't look like a, a, a recovered drunk. I look like a drunk without a drink in me yet. And I start looking for external conditions to fix this, this season, discomfort within me. And it comes in women, it comes in sex, it comes in food, it comes in gambling, it comes a lot of unspiritual behavior. My mind, my thinking cosigns to say, you're okay because you're special. And the next thing I know, it gets so bad, I need a drink just to breathe again and then I'm drunk. And then we talk about you. That can happen over a year, two years, five years, can happen in a day. It happens to people like us because step one tells me as a real alcoholic, the guy on page 21, I'm drinking. Not that I can't drink, I'm going to drink. I'll drink over hitting Powerball, I'll drink over a broken heart, but I'm going to drink and only power that's going to keep me to spiritual airbag is my relationship with God. So as a recovered member, we have, I have a responsibility to talk to you experientially about this power called God. What it looks like for me, I, I, I will tell you, I'm no longer a seeker of belief or faith. I did when I came in, I believed that you believed. I had faith that it was going to work for me because it worked for you. But like a drink, I can believe it's working in you, I see you getting drunk. Until I taste it and the medicine goes down and I erupt, I don't really know what it's like. So I'm a seeker of experience with this power called God. So I can report back to you the good news. So I can be a better effective agent for God. Step 10 talks about entering the world of the spirit. And I can only do that with an awakened uh, soul, with an awakened spirit. As I'm cleaning up amends, my book tells me this. I can't just step into uh, uh, step 10 and 11. I can't think my way to a spiritual transformation. Right thinking, you hear that right thinking leads to right actions. That's really, really self-help. And if right thinking led to right actions, I would have said, well, a drink hurts me, so let me take positive, constructive action. I don't need to come to AA. The problem with me is my thinking is always thinking, and it's always wrong. My thinking is like this. I'm always thinking about me. And even when I tell you, let's not think, let's not talk about me, let's talk about you. What do you think of me is how I operate. Is this on? <laughs> I, I got it. <laughs> More coffee for this crew. No. <laughs> says, enter the world of the spirit. It says, my next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. And the way I was brought up in this deal is take statements, flip them into questions. What am I doing to grow in understanding and effectiveness? What does that look like? 
Right? Am I current on my amends? Am I up to date on amends? Because if I'm in the process of making amends and I'm actively seeking people out that I can go seek without causing more harm, I slide into step 10. And then I have some things to do in step 10. But if I've stopped making amends because I fell in love with the effect produced by it and I don't think I need anything else, how can I really walk into step 10 if I have maybe 100 or 200 or 50 outstanding amends that I'm not making? How can I really enter the world of the spirit, this very narrow gate, while I have a whole bunch of yesterdays hanging around me? How can I be present to the moment if I'm still listening to voices of the past? How could I move forward and wear the world like a loose garment if I have an anchor around my neck from all the yesterdays that are unresolved? I can't do it. And the gate we pass through in 1011 is a narrow gate and a very narrow road to which God has me to walk through. Many are going to walk through a wide gate and a very wide road we're going to take in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's okay. But if I really want to experience the abundance of God that we talk about and ought to shout from the rooftops in AA, it's a narrow gate. And in the discipline of this work, there's a tremendous amount of freedom. But not everyone who walks into AA is going to be seeking that path. How desperate am I? Am I in a place of compliance or surrender after so many years? Did I come in here in a place of surrender and got comfortable, and now I'm just kind of going along because the big book's popular in my neighborhood, so that's what I'll do. I work with words like turn, watch, aware, and observe. Turn, watch, aware, and observe throughout the day. Turn in in order to go out. Turn into this power in order to go out. Of myself, I am nothing. The Father do with the works. I need to be really clear on that. So I'm turning, I'm turning, I'm turning. Being still when I'm supposed to be still, speaking when there's an invitation to speak, turn in in order to go out. Watch, aware, and observe. How am I doing? Am I mindful of you while you're speaking or while you're answer, asking me something? I've already got the answer planned. How am I doing? Am I present to the moment? Turn, watch, aware, and observe. And my step 10 is about cleaning up any damage I did during the day because I'm, I'm liable to cause some damage the day as soon as I start thinking. Because whenever I'm thinking, usually what's behind that is fear. And what's behind fear is ego. What you're going to give me, what you're going to do for me. Even when I'm kind, I'm a self-seeker. And here come defects of character. So it's about turn, watch, and observe how I'm doing through the day. Here's the great thing that happens. Perhaps at the beginning, for many of us, I know it was for me, I had to be really mindful of that stuff. How's my language? How is my actions? Am I turning in? Am I making amends for something I shouldn't have said just now? And it was very mindful of what I'm doing. But the, the idea is to have this book become internalized, that the information in this book becomes part of who I be. So I don't need to remember, go to God. I don't need to remember, make amends. It's who I be now. We become direct reflections of this power called God, and nothing less than that great fact. Page 25 talks about this. It says, I've been rocketed, we've been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence. How many times we go right over that one? What are they talking about? My whole life was living in three dimensions. I was, I was driven by my obsessions, my compulsions, and my emotions. They own me, need to feel good. Need to feel good. Got to get stuff to feel good. Just give me more stuff. More relationships, more money, more cars, whatever it might be. An amplifier, anything. Just get me stuff to feel good because being alone is awful. The fourth dimension, I go past all that and we get to, I get to experience oneness with this power called God. No more separateness. And when we get to experience that, we are in a place where we can experience the God and everyone else. Even though we may disagree, even though we may not even get along, but we at least meet with a spirit of love and tolerance. This is what it's like entering the world of the spirit. When the carpenter says, wear the world like a loose garment, this is what we can experience. We're not away from that. We're not separate from that. Everything we've been given, everything I've been given to, to walk this walk was given to me the day I arrived on my belly button birthday. God didn't shortchange me. God didn't make me sick. I accumulate stuff along the way. I accumulate belief systems, I accumulate ideas, I accumulate fears, and I govern them, I watch them, I protect them, and I will fight to the end for them until I got to a place of bottoming out when the drink was removed and I was still stuck with me in all of this and the package was damaged. And what I've come, become clear on now a whole bunch of years later is that I am damaged goods, I'm broken. 
My sponsor told me, he says, Peter, you're riding a horse backwards and you're never going to face forward. I'm broken. Alcoholics Anonymous is a room full of broken toys. Those toys that don't work on Christmas morning. And here we meet. And that is the great equalizer. Some of us do many things well. Some of us do a few things great. We can't necessarily do ordinary things well, but we do extraordinary things, don't we, in AA? But we're broken. And the only way I'm able to get fixed, not in my way, not my time, but with God's hands, in His time and His way. But I better be having, I get to have a spiritual practice. So when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm looking at, you know, making amends, and I enter the world of the Spirit, didn't know I was entering the world of the Spirit. I didn't walk around and say, I'm entering the world of the Spirit. It was just a thing that happened, where you wake up one day and you realize life has changed dramatically. For me, it was simple. I was bathing twice a day and eating three times a day. This was the age of miracles for me. I was still sober, I was going to meetings, I started to sponsor folks, and I still had a sponsor, and at the end of the day, when I put my head on the pillow, I didn't hurt anyone. This was a huge 180 compared to the way I was living on my way into Alcoholics Anonymous. So things were starting to happen. I wasn't thinking about drinking. The obsession was long gone. I look forward to prayer and meditation. I was making amends. I was doing all the things they told me, and I realized things were changing differently. But my practice looked different than what it is now. I was told at the very beginning that every night I was to sit down and take a nightly review and reflect on my day. And that was not done. My, all my sponsors have told me that's not an exercise of the mind because I need to be completely out of my mind to experience God. And if I'm reflecting on my day, it's coming from a thinking mind. And I can't solve a problem with the same mind that creates it. And so I put pen to paper after prayer and I would reflect. I would answer the questions in the book. And the way I do inventory now at night is with just four column inventory. That's the way I do it. And I take a look at where I was resentful, where I was fearful. Did my harm uh, uh, hurt anyone? And I put it on paper. And what do I do with that inventory is I share it with my sponsor. And he gets it all. And then my job at that point is to listen to the direction he gives me. Each night, I sit with prayer and meditation. When I first started, I would pray and try to meditate. Now I meditate. A practice that we don't talk a lot about in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was at a meeting, um, oh Lord, I think I was in either Mississippi or, or, or Louisiana. And during one of these deals of talking about the 11th step, uh, God had me go on and on about meditation. And this guy, as soon as the meeting ended, made a beeline from the back of the room. I says, here we go again. He's coming right at me. And he just went up one side down, one up down, down the other side on me, on me talking about what he claimed was Eastern philosophy in AA, about meditation. And he explained to me the, re, uh, the Webster's Dictionary of what meditation is supposed to be about. And so I meet resistance with no resistance. I said, okay, great. This is how I do this, how you do it, live and let live, have a nice day, don't talk to me ever again. And uh, <laughs> so the next morning, I'm doing a Sunday morning talk, and I finish the talk, and I happen to talk again about a whole bunch of meditation, 11 step stuff, and here comes that guy again. And he comes right to the podium and he says, can you sponsor me? <laughs> the truth is true until we find out it no longer isn't. And one thing about getting hit with the truth, that doesn't always feel good. Walking this walk doesn't always feel good. A spiritual life doesn't feel good at times because every belief system that, was, that I had was being challenged. And in order to experience the truth, the false must die, huh? Well, that's not an easy task. What an order I go through? I can't go through it. How desperate am I to experience God? How desperate am I to experience freedom? If I have some freedom now, do I want to get freer? And if I'm sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in bondage like I did in my first six months, why? When God is seeking every one of us in here, is begging for a relationship with every one of us in here, and yet many of us, I did it for the first six months, would come to AA, hang in there for an hour, and back out to there, back out there to the insane world with civilians, trying to act, interact with civilians. 
I couldn't even interact with people of my type in here. How is I going to make it out there? And I just run from meeting to meeting to meeting. And why do I need to walk around in bondage when I'm given this on a silver platter? And I get to grow in understanding and effectiveness. When I first got into this deal, um, my meditation practice lasted about two minutes. And I know that because there was someone teaching me who put me on a two-minute timer. Just two minutes. She gave me posture and breath to sit in after meditation just to still the mind because it was my greatest enemy. It still is. And two minutes felt like it was going on and on and on for weeks and on end. When is this two minutes going to end? And what I did in those two minutes was think about a lot of things. I need to be doing things. I need to go places. I need to do stuff. When is this thing going to end? Two minutes. And I stayed on two minutes for about a week, and then it went to three minutes, and then it went to five minutes, and it went to six minutes. And somewhere after a couple of months, when I got like eight, ten minutes, I didn't need a timer anymore, I was meditating. And there was still lots of noise in the head. And one of the great ways to clean out the noise, to shut the voice down, is what am I doing for spiritual growth? Do I have a nightly review? How much time do I sp spend in prayer? Do I have fidelity to my God? Or do I have God and other gods? Do I have things like pride and idolatry in the way? Is she God? Is that car God? Is my money God? Or do I just practice fidelity to God? And when I'm cleaning up the wreckage of my day with steps 10 and 11, and I have a life of meditation, and I'm seeking God with the desperation for drowning man, and I'm giving it all away in service, and taking these principles into my homes, occupations, and affairs, where I got to one day was more often than not sitting in meditation with a lot less noise. And then I found out that the silence I'm experiencing in meditation, I can't create. How can I create that which already exists? It's always there. The silence is always present. It's always within me. It's where I come from and where I'll return one day. And how come I can't walk throughout my day coming from that stillness? Which means I'm not coming from a mind. Because anytime I come from the mind, I'm about to hurt somebody or myself. My fear comes from my mind, my resentments come from my mind, my, re, my belief systems and my conceptions and perceptions about life in general all come from this wonderful predator called the thinking mind. I hope everyone loses their mind this weekend and it never returns. A <laughs> book says we developed this vital sixth sense. I thought about that, sat with that. We develop a vital sixth sense beyond the five we were given at birth. That sixth sense is that, that intuitiveness, that little thing in the spirit that says, go, be still, speak, go, stay, talk. And it could be as simple as you're on a diet and you're going down the grocery market lane and you want to get the ice cream. The little voice says, no, we're taking care of ourselves, no ice cream. Very often we think God's going to be this booming Moses voice only to us, he speaks. My God is a little bit better. I know you have God minds a little bit better than yours. And God speaks in a booming voice, parts the seas every time. Sometimes God has a little quiet voice that says no. And for some reason we listen to it. That's the sixth sense that we begin to develop. And I always challenge that, that it's always been present. We've just never learned to listen to it. And if I'm clear, I can hear. And I need to be clear of me. Experience the death of self for successful living. Less me, more God. It only comes through the spiritual disciplines of, of 10 and 11. Having moved through step 9. I mean, a new person can take 10 and 11, start working with them, but we have a lot of things in the way. Defects of character, unfinished amends, unmanageability. A little relationship with God. Perhaps the God is still a group of drunks for good orderly direction. And we really haven't cemented a relationship in oneness with this power called God yet. The great thing about our 12 steps is that they guarantee me a spiritual transformation. They guarantee me that. Back in step two, they were talking about how I'm going to be restored to sanity. It's the place I'm going to get to, that we will get to. A place of sanity, wholeness, truth, God. And insane thinking is gone. And so off we march in a place of desperation and not compliance. And by the time we get to step 10, by the time I get to step 10, they deliver the contract which says sanity has been returned. We get to a place called recovered, placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. I see a drink, I'm over here, so be it. 
I used to do that. I don't do it anymore. There's no push. There's no pull. There's no running away. There's no trying to escape. It is, I am so be it. I walk with the armor of God. How many of us have done the 12-step call and got the dry goods and threw them out? Poured the liquor down the sink? Threw the bottles out and took the drunk to a, to a detox? And there was no push and pull on the stuff? But if I'm doing a 12-step call and I'm looking at it a little too long and I'm looking at the powder wondering one more time, then something wrong with my spiritual condition. I'm not in a position of neutrality safe and protected. I'm still a little bit untreated. I still got some self going on. I still got some work to do. But if I do the work that's laid out in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, we will arrive. We will get to that place of neutrality, safe and protect. And here's the great thing. I can't live life on life's terms. When I'm working with 10 and 11 just to seek the glory of God, to be an effective agent for him, not only the drink deal has disappeared, but how I interact with other people has changed. How I do life is no longer on life on life's terms, but life on God's terms, which means the things I couldn't do, I can do well. I'm responsible, accountable. I'm dependable. I have some integrity. All because of this power called God. It just doesn't happen to me just for showing up at an AA meeting and getting a little 90-day coin. Everyone applauds, but I still might be a lunatic and very untreated. My experience has been I'm very dangerous sober. Probably more sober than, uh, uh, more dangerous than drunk. I don't have medicine to kind of simmer me down a little bit. And the thinking is flourishing when I'm not drinking. So I need to experience this power called God. The real transformation for me really doesn't happen until I step into the unknown. And the interesting thing about living, uh, uh, cleaning up amends and going from steps 10 and 11, I'm going from a place that I know that's tangible to a place called the unknown. It's the world of the spirit, something I never experienced before. And many folks say it's a leap of faith. And my, my experience has been, what leap of faith? There's no such thing as a leap of faith. It almost sounds like self-reliance. Good luck, leap of faith. Well, who inspired me to leap? God. Who's in the middle of the leap? God. And who's going to catch me when I land? God. There's no gravity in God's world, there's no leap of faith, it's just change. And if nothing changes, nothing changes. The spiritual walk sometimes can be a lonely walk. They don't talk about that in the book. A disciplined life, think about it. We're in discipline. God will discipline us. I've, left, I left, I let, I've led an undisciplined life most of my life. And we all know what that looks like. And I hung around with people who were the same. I can do that in AA. But this disciplined life can be a lonely way, lonely walk. Most of maybe your home group is not praying and meditating, doing inventory and have a sponsor up there and amends. You are. And they kind of look at you a little cross-eyed. But we sleep at night. We have a good, positive, productive day. We're doing God's work. Very narrow gate. Am I wavering? And getting pushed around like the wind pushes the ocean around? From side to side, forwards and backwards. Am I wavering? Am I double-minded? Or am I right with God? I'm clear. I know what my purpose is. God born me, made me born for a reason. God got me sober for a reason. Am I clear on that purpose? Because the path was laid out the day I arrived on this planet, like for every one of us. And what I did was cover the road. And what we do is uncover this road, the uncover discovering and discarding so we can get to our truth. Uncomfortability is a part of a spiritual path because I'm constantly being changed. I'm constantly getting challenged. The byproduct of that is a little bit of humility along the way, knowing I'm right, being made right size, and that I'm broken. I'm weak flesh, born into the slavery of skin, another uh, of sin, another book says. Weak flesh, born into the slavery of sin. That's my lot. And my mind's always trying to pull me in that direction. Only with the power of God do I get right again. Can I be grateful? You know, on a spiritual path, it's a lot different than being untreated. When I came into alcohol synonymous, it was like, give me. 
I need this to be okay. I need her to be okay. I need this much money to be okay. On a spiritual path, can I be grateful when there's no food in my belly? Or do I need a banquet to be grateful? Can I be grateful when there's no money in my pocket? Do I need a pocket full of hundreds to be okay? Do I need all the ducks in a row to feel okay? Getting challenged regularly, walking a narrow path can be really uncomfortable, especially when I'm being pushed in directions I never thought I can go to. Like talking in front of folks. I was usually the guy in the corner somewhere, just get a chair in the corner while everyone was dancing on the floor. Not me, just give me a drink, put me in a corner and leave me alone. I just need to know there's people around me. Doesn't mean I want to interact with you. <laughs> you know? Or getting to do some of the things I get to do today. My book talks about when I retire at night. I constructively review my day. Doesn't mean I'm going to find out what a terrible person I am, but I constructively review my day. And it asked me, where was I resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? Kind of assuming I'm going to do that stuff. Do I owe an apology to anyone? Because I'm on a spiritual path doesn't mean I'm flawless. I'm going to make mistakes. The difference is I'm willing to clean them up as it happens. As I go, I will make it right. I will go to God, turn in to, in order to go out, turn to God, Father, what do I do about this? I was just inappropriate with someone. You need to go make it right. How many of us have accidentally taken a pen off a desk and walk out the door and have to go back and say, oh, I took your pen? Yeah. No, when you have someone else's pen. Right? Normally we take the cash register with us, the computer with us, the TV <laughs> with us. Do I owe an apology? Have I kept something to myself which should be discussed with another person at once? Was I kind and loving toward all? What have I done better? Was I thinking of myself most of the time or what I can do for others or how I can pack into the stream of life, be a part of? What can I bring? And the big thing is when I'm out there in interacting with other people, I need to pray to God and ask God to direct my thinking from me dishonest and self-seeking motives, because that's when I get into trouble when I'm walking around with other people. Right. One of the things I'm able to uh, uh, talk about uh, in the day at a time overcoming is this fear-based and insecure person that's talking to you this morning. Apologizing for breathing to other people. I'm a complete mistake. I have no right even walking into Alcoholics Anonymous. And what that would do, because the defects of character are all driven by fear, and having very little 10 and 11 work until I got into this work, was I would always play for the crowd. No matter where you went, you had to look good, had to sound good. I'm perfect. Have to be on all the time, because God forbid if you thought a little bit less than me, I'd be crushed. You need to adore me. As a gentleman, Clancy says something like, we have to, people have to be treated extra special just to feel normal. Please like me. If you like me, I'll be in love with you. And I play different roles for you to like me. And I play to the crowd as an image issue that I need to look good. I need to sound good all the time. It's bondage. It's slavery to the mind. It's slavery to self. And we can still experience that in Alcoholics Anonymous. And little by slowly, that starts to loosen its, 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 the shackles on us. But there's something else going on. I got this voice in the head that when I look in the mirror, it looks back and says, Loser, who are you kidding? You're still a drunk. You look terrible. You're too thin, you're too fat, you're too tall, you're too short, and it goes on and on and on. So what I do is I start to acquire more stuff to put on this empty shell, dress up a broken wound, get more stuff. So I look in the mirror and say, well, I'm doing okay, got lots of money, I got a new car, got a new relation, maybe I am good, and no matter how much I try to dress it up, it's short-lived, and I'm back to listening to this voice in the head again. When does that end? You know, we walk into a meeting, how you doing? I'm great. I'm absolutely Moses. Today, everything's beautiful. I've meditated. I'm up to date. I'm, I'm sponsoring a lot of people. Nothing bothers me until we get back in the car. <laughs> and we look in the rearview mirror and the eyes look back and says, look at you. What a life you got. How lame is lame. And it never ends. And then we get a big book called Alcoholics Anonymous put in our lap and we say, let's go through. We can get free of that. And we debate. I'm going to work on my 90 meetings in 90 days first, where many of us drink and die. 
And one of the freedoms I've been able to experience is those type of voices in the head have been shut down for the most part. Oh, they show up from time to time. The thing is, I'm not hooking into them. The sense of who I be doesn't come from mind. It doesn't come from thought. Where it comes from nowadays, most often, is from spirit. So I need to be clear to hear. And we go in meditation to darkness to see and silence to hear. Do I have a life of meditation? Where my father has brought me, and it's a bunch of years now, is working with prayer and meditation three times times a day. That's just the way it's been made. That wasn't the game plan. And I don't say that to separate myself from you or be a little bit different. It's just where my truth is. On awakening, somewhere in the middle of the day, usually around two, three o'clock, when I have a nice big break during work, I'll sit in my car or go to a parking lot. I'll go anywhere. I work with a little religious practice, make some prayer, and I sit. Get centered. Get my GPS back. Get right. Get, I call it getting small. Because, you know, the day's going on, you're juggling, doing lots of stuff. You get small. Go with breath. And then in the evening. And I will tell you, last night, uh, I, I, I looked like a drunk in the back of the room. I was in and out of, like, trances. I was so tired. I was up at 3 a.m., did all the traveling. It was, it was a long night. And when I got back to my room, I mean, I just wanted to sleep on the floor. I was so tired. But God has disciplined me in a simple way outlined in this book. So you know what I did? I did some prayer. I reviewed my day. I did some meditation. And I was done. Wasn't the most earth-shattering meditation I did. Maybe not the most precise inventory I've ever written. But in discipline, there's freedom. And that's what I did. And I slept. Because I, took, I would take my mind to bed with me. My mind would take me to bed with me and all the day with me. And I toss and turn all day and I wake up Monday with a hangover from Sunday. And two weeks later, I'm still resenting somebody or I'm still fearful about something. And why? Because my mind insists on, on generating this stuff over and over and over again. And in discipline, there's freedom. So I go through my day. When I'm agitated, I pause. When I'm doubtful, I pause. And I have found out the pause can be for a minute. The pause can be a while. Maybe I need to seek counsel with the sponsor, another AA member. Maybe I need to do nothing, but I practice pause. My sponsor, Mark, would say, practice pause. Work with the word pause. Pause. Be still. You ever see some of these Buddhist monks? You ever been around them? You might say, good morning. And they don't say, how are you? How's everything? We're going to the meeting. They just, they just bow and keep walking. There's no need to speak, they would tell me. Pete, there is no need to speak, just be still. If I'm not speaking, I can hear you. If I'm not speaking, I can observe what's around me and be mindful and present. The great thing about step 10 and 11, we have some information in the book, but it talks about working with other books along with, never instead of, being quick to see where religious people are right, make use of what they offer. They're telling us, go! Go experience, spread the spiritual wings, and we can grow in understanding and effectiveness. And where we came into AA and where we land a few years later, it's not even the same person. We've been moved for change from the inside out. And experientially, we get to talk about that, and I get to be a better effective agent for this power called God. Abundance is a good word. God's giving in abundance and always seeking every one of us out. We've been born to be saints. We don't come into sainthood because we've always been a saint. We practice these principles and become agents for God because we know what hell looks like. We've been there. The book says the age of miracles is still with us. I think every one of our lives is a direct reflection and evidence bearing witness for others of that. So I get to work with steps 10 and 11, and uh, quite frankly, I've, all my teachers have influenced me to gobble up lots of books. And the books I read, I work with. I don't just read. I work with underline, highlight, ask questions, take statements, turn them into questions, and I meditate on the information. And I sit with it. So whatever book, spiritual book I'm working with becomes part of who I be. There was a time when I was uh, uh, growing up where I'm a Catholic, and the belief systems I was given was every other religion is second. And so it was difficult for me to listen to people of other religions. 
And some things happened uh, a bunch of years ago with 9-11, and I was uh, in Atlanta working, and I, like most of us, thought the world was ending, and I didn't know what to do. And I remember that day, I dropped to my knees, I made some prayer, and I prayed for the folks who were dying and those who already died, and what came to me was praying for my enemies. And God filled their hearts with a spirit of love because I, what came to me, if their hearts were spill, filled with a spirit of love, things like this would stop happening. But I was still looking. How do you make sense of this? Where do I go? I'm a Catholic. I wanted to see a priest. I wanted to talk to an AA member. I wanted to talk to some, someone who, for me, had substance. But because God opened me up and made me open-minded, my answer came from a rabbi. And it was a time I wouldn't even listen. And what he said made absolutely perfect sense. It had depth and weight. It was caring. It was compassion. It was truth. One of the benefits of working with this book, when it says be quick to see where religious people are right, doesn't, even, doesn't only mean Catholic people. It means whoever they are. I become a student. I approach this with a beginner's mind. I'm like a child around God. It's a great way to live, no longer uh, experiencing the bondage of self. Um, I've learned this. When the ground is, ground is fertile, God will do the growing. And when the heart is open, God will give us what we need. He hears the heart. He reads the soul. He knows what we're searching for, knows how to feed us in his time, in his way. And there were some experiences that happened to me as a direct result of step 10 and 11 with all the preparation work in 1 through 9 into 10 and 11 to the power of meditation. The healing that goes on in meditation, the rightness that happens, the okayness that happens in meditation. And there were some riddles in my life. I lost my mom when I was a kid to suicide, and I wondered for years, what happened? Where is she? What did this, where do I go from here? And what happened to me in meditation completely flipped me around, the, the 180. And I came out of this powerful meditation experience with the answers delivered to me, and better than that was knowing that I am known by my Creator. Step 11 stuff. Just a few pages in our book. Page and a half about step 10. A couple of pages about step 11. They didn't go on and on. It wasn't a self-help book. It wasn't a novel. Clear cut, precise, specific, exact directions for a guy like me to develop a relationship with God, which is what this book provides me with. It drives me back to God, to the power that's keeping me sober. Lastly, I come in here with grace. I stay sober with grace. And isn't it great that we can experience the power that gives us grace rather than just talking about grace? And then I get to give it all away in step 12. Now, as an alcoholic, if I got something good, you ain't getting any. <laughs> Don't touch my drink. Don't touch my drink. You know, when you bar somebody's lean over, you, you push back my drinks here. Don't touch. We do an AA is give the whole thing away. And it seems like every time I give away, I get full. But I'm not giving it away to be full. That would be selfish. It's giving it away because that's who I be. For fun and for free. And get to take this into my, own, my home occupations and affairs. Okay? That's all I got. Peace.